Welcome to today's webinar, From Quality to Impact, It's All About the Data, sponsored by Intellix. I'm uh, Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest and your host for today's webinar. Uh, new technologies to enhance connectedness, intelligence, and automation are being introduced to operations at a very rapid pace. And the future of work across all industries, across your industry, is about generating, keeping track, and getting data where it needs to go. Effective data management helps organizations maintain order and constant day-to-day -day and builds the capacity to capture new opportunities. So, how will you manage this transformation? How will you handle all this data? And that's what this webinar is all about. We're going to discuss a lot of things today, but uh, some of the key points are going to be what counts as data, what master data is, how data governments, governance uh, supports information and knowledge management, how effective information and knowledge management can greatly enhance the value of your improvement projects and Kaizen events, and a whole lot more. Uh, before I introduce today's presenter, just a reminder that at any time, you can send questions to us using the Q&A box. You can find the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, or if you see a pull-down menu at the top of your screen, click that, and you'll see a Q&A button that you can click to open up the Q&A box. Send your questions at any time. Uh, a recording of this webinar, as well as a copy of the slides, will be available one day after the webinar, and we'll send you an email that has all that information on it uh, sometime tomorrow. Okay, today's presenter is Nicole Radziwill, Vice President of Global Quality and Supply Chain Practice at uh, Intellex in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, she has over two decades of experience with quality in software, telecom, manufacturing, aerospace, research instrumentation, and food and beverage industries. She has her PhD in quality systems from India State and is a tenured associate professor at James Madison University. Nicole is also an ASQ fellow and is one of the ASQ's influential voices. You can read her blogs at Quality and Innovation. Dot com. That's qualityandinnovation.com. Okay, Nicole, go ahead. Thank you so much, Dirk, and uh, hello to everyone who's here. Welcome to today's webinar, and, and thanks so much for taking some time to, to join us today. The, the topic of data as an aspect of quality management, it's, it's one that's always been important, but it's, it's really starting to heat up in response to the, the new challenges associated with emerging technologies, so Industry 4.0, Quality 4.0. So I hope that you'll find something useful and interesting today. Um, there is a lot of content, like Dirk mentioned, but he'll be sending you the slides later, so don't worry about taking notes or missing something. We will make sure that the material is available to you. So the title is From Quality to Impact, and, and what we're going to do is tell you a story about how you can make sure the data you're collecting in your QMS and your related systems, how you can make sure it actually yields, improvements, and business results. Uh, my name is Nicole Radswell. I'm the quality practice lead at Intellex in Toronto, and we sell environment, health, safety, and quality management software, EHSQ. And as you can imagine, effective data management is, is critical if you want to use your EHSQ system to uncover insights. Um, and it's becoming absolutely essential, especially if you plan to do any real-time sensing in your future work environment. Personally, I, I care a lot about data. In fact, most of my career is included managing data, analyzing data, or, or both. Uh, and for about 10 years, I, I led data management efforts at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. So there, we were dealing with what's now called big data um, about 20 years ago. So in the next hour, I'll be sharing some of what I learned there, but updated for the modern context. So we're all familiar with generating data. Every time we log a nonconformance or make note of a corrective action, we're adding new data. And, and similarly, Every time we add a new customer or employee, that's also new data. Um, but on its own, data isn't terribly useful. We have to convert it into information. We have to give it meaning uh, and give it context so that we can use it to make business decisions that will help us um, you know, move the needle. So you can extract value from data this way. But if you don't do something with the information you generate beyond using it yourself, you're missing additional opportunities for improvement, for progress, for growth, uh, all those things. Uh, you, you're missing opportunities to generate broader impacts. So the question is, how are you spreading that value throughout your organization? How are you getting information to the people who need it? How are you helping them understand it so that they can take appropriate actions, that sort of thing? So collecting and analyzing data 
It's only the first step. Impact, in contrast, that's, that takes strategy, communication, collaboration, because you've got to spread it around. And where we're going to start today is on April 26, 1986. We all, we all have moments in our life where we remember exactly where we were or what we were experiencing or, or how we felt. And this is one of those moments for me. My mom and I were visiting her sister because my cousin had just been born about a month earlier. And I remember that night we were, we were all sitting in the living room watching Peter Jennings on the nightly news. And, and he let everybody know that there had been an accident on the other side of the world at the Chernobyl nuclear plant. So I had just had my birthday. And this news made me really uncomfortable. Um, even though I was in North Carolina at the time, I was convinced that I wouldn't make it to my next birthday. So huge impact on me. Um, the picture that you see here is from the, the new HBO drama, uh, Chernobyl, which came out in May of 2019. It's definitely a worthwhile watch. I, I highly recommend it. You, you're going to learn more about the, the perspe perspectives on and the handling of the incident um, and how the, the radioactive plumes impacted the local region, how they impacted Europe, uh, and ultimately how they did spread around the world. Um, you know, as you can probably tell, fortunately, I, I didn't perish as a result of this uh, event, but many people did. Uh, only the nuclear incident in Japan uh, after the March 2011 earthquake, only that event is comparable in terms of death and damage. So this whole story is fascinating, but what really caught me when I was watching the HBO special was something in the early scenes. So um, very shortly after the meltdown occurred, while the operators were still hanging out in the control room, one of them measured how much radiation was in the environment. He used a dosimeter, much like the one you see on the left-hand side there. Um, the, the one you see is really similar to the standard issue models that were available in Russia in the mid-80s. So the operator turns it on, and it reads 3.6 rentgens per hour. His boss says, you know, that's not great but it's not terrible. Uh, a little bit later, they get a more sensitive instrument, but as soon as they turn that one on, the second one, it shorts out, so they can't get a second reading. They could have gotten the more sensitive dosimeter that was stored in the safe, but it was, the safe was locked, nobody had the key, so they just you know, didn't go get it. So you know, the, the, in the ensuing hours, um, the officials came, they showed up to the facility, and from uh, their protected bunker, somewhere on the site, that's where you see in the room here, um, they, they talk about what's happening. So one of these officials asks the operator who was on duty, you reported that the radiation situation was in, within normal limits. And the operator says, well, right, that's what the instrument showed. Um, but it's then that, that this guy, um, his name is Valerie Legosov, he's a nuclear chemist. He asks, what value did the instrument show? And the operator says again, um, 3.6 rentgens per hour. So um, rentgens are the units of measurement for how much radiation is being emitted in the environment. It's not a perfect measure. Um, sieverts are maybe a, a little bit better. They, they indicate the impact of the radiation on the human body. But um, even the word rentgen in German means x-ray. So, you know, measures of radiation. So Legasov hears that number, that 3.6. And just hearing the number, he realizes how bad the situation is because he knows exactly what's being measured. He knows some context. And not only does he know that the second dosimeter has shorted out, but he's seen some of the workers already have radiation sickness, and he knows how long it's taken for that to set in, not that long at all. But most critically, he knows, about, he knows information about that, that standard issue dosimeter. So... Just a little bit of background, the, the World Health Organization, they set some limits on exactly how much radiation you can be around. And, and you know, when you get x-rays, th this is one of the things that determines uh, how much x-ray, how many x-rays you can get in a particular period of time. So for most of us, that World Health Organization limit of radiation is a half a rentgen per year. Not per hour, like the, the similar measures, but per year. So if you're a nuclear engineer or operator, um, you get to be exposed to a little bit more. The, the limit is going to be five rentgens also per year. So that initial dosimeter, that was producing a year's worth of the radiation limit, even for plant operators, in about an hour and a half. But there's more to the story because uh, an accumulation, you know, radiation accumulates in your body. So an accumulation of around 300 Rankins 
that's going to lead to radiation sickness. And um, this guy, Legasov, he already knew people, that the workers were already sick. They had already been exposed to 300 Rankins. And at 500, the exposure to the radiation can be fatal. So the shocking insight that he had was that 3.6 Rankins was the maximum value on that particular model of dosimeter. The instrument wasn't designed to go any higher. In fact, the, the ambient radiation near the reactor was between 800 and 1,500 Rankins per hour. And at the site of the meltdown, um, it got up to like 20,000 per hour. That, that's how much was being emitted. So the situation was totally deadly. But a lack of understanding of the data or what it really meant cost many people their lives. And, you know, the, the even more stark thing is that this was only one data point. Just one data point can have this much impact. And, you know, why is understanding of data becoming even more critically important now? I mean, when, you know, one particular data point can have that much impact? And here's the answer to that, because many of our industries are being revolutionized by connected sensors, by actuators, by the Internet of Things. Th this chart right here, uh, this is produced by a company that makes cybersecurity intrusion detection software, and it shows just how many billions of devices are already in service, so billions. Each device, each IoT device, produces a handful, maybe, maybe even hundreds of observations every minute or every hour. That's a lot of data, tons of data, and, and a lot of potential meaning can be derived from that data too. There are lots of players and stakeholders in this Internet of Things. This diagram right here, uh, shows just one example of how smart manufacturing and smart environmental monitoring and smart buildings uh, and even smart security might be integrated um, using cloud computing to link producers and consumers. In a lot of these cases, the operations technology or OT, um, that's the, the software behind the firewall and the factory floor. Um, the OT has to work synergistically with information technology or, or IT. It's the IT that manages things like business processes and event logging. So OT has to be highly available, always on. And the integrity of the data is also really, really important. Confidentiality, you know, not so much because it's, it's mainly machines talking to each other on the factory floor. On the IT side, though, the priorities are reversed. So, you know, with your, with your personal information, you'd prefer confidentiality over integrity and you'd prefer integrity over availability. So, so these priorities are, are applied differently. And one of the reasons is that OT can be in service for a very long time. That operations technology has a long lifetime of 10 to 40 years. And much of the old technology wasn't designed with cybersecurity in mind. On the other hand, um, the other hand IT has um, much shorter life cycles. Uh, for example, even if you haven't updated your operating system on your own computer in a while, it's probably been within the past five years. So, so these two environments, the, the IT environment and the OT environment, they're different. Uh, the way you have to manage things is different. And the way you can remember these priorities is remembering CIA. It's just that um, they're reversed. Um, for operations, it's backwards. And for information technology, it is forwards. There's another CIA, too. Uh, quality and performance improvement in the IoT era. It's driven by three things, connectedness, intelligence, and automation. So in quality, we're working to connect people to machines, the data. Uh, we're connecting people to each other. Um, we're trying to make our systems more intelligent at the same time um, to make sure that things are more efficient, more effective, more productive, more usable. And then finally, we're trying to automate as much as possible so that we can reduce costs, so we can increase time to value. And, and data is absolutely critical for each of these observations because the utility of data is going to depend on the connections, how you can get it. Automation is going to move that data around to accomplish goals. And then intelligence is going to help us achieve our goals better and easier and, and more effectively. So this is the quality perspective on Industry 4.0. The, um, the Internet of Things is a core element of Industry 4.0, but um, more generally, it's characterized by cyber physical systems. So what cyber physical systems are, are tangible objects connected to networks. They can communicate with data repositories. They can communicate with other objects. And they can even communicate with people. So where this fits into the context of 
all of the Industrial Revolutions um, is, is this. Since the late 1700s, uh, the, the first revolution was driven by harnessing steam and water power. Uh, the second one was driven by harnessing the electricity. And then finally, in the, in the late 60s, um, it was possible to automate logical activities. So um, you didn't need people to, to stand by machines and, and do every single, you know, make every single decision and execute it. So now, with, uh, with a robust internet and communications infrastructure, um, along with the, the devices uh, that, that can interoperate, um, we've got, we're on the verge of the, the fourth industrial revolution. So why is this revolution happening now? Well, there's a, a few factors there. Because of the solid infrastructure that we now have, because we have devices and systems producing so much data, the big data, and the availability of amazing and, and oftentimes free software libraries to analyze and understand that data. We didn't have that uh, 20 years ago. Um, we also, you know, we have a, a much more skilled workforce. Uh, back in the beginning part of the 2000s, um, you needed to get engineers, research scientists to do some of this, and so uh, the field has been really democratized over, you know, particularly the past five years, but definitely the last 10 years. So in our discussion of data, uh, we'll talk about these six things. So you also heard about these in the intro. Uh, the titles on each of the slides that you see from here on out are going to be labeled with those numbers, one through six. And so that's how you'll be able to see how far along in the webinar we are. So what counts as data? Uh, like we mentioned, IoT and, and other enabling technologies, like, for example, social media, um, they generate ridiculous amounts of data, and, and this big data has several defining characteristics. The four Vs on this slide, you've probably heard of them already. Volume uh, is, of course, the, the defining factor there. Velocity, so, you know, not just, it, not just data that's sitting in one place, but data that's streaming towards us. Uh, variety, heterogeneous formats, and veracity, or, you know, how much can you trust this data? Um, but there's also other factors, other characteristics of big data that aren't mentioned as frequently. Um, for example, let's say, you're, let's say you're using publicly accessible data like tweets. Who, who owns that data? Um, the policies of, of the organization can change at any time, uh, and those policies can impact your ability to use the data. Uh, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, the Twitter API changed again, and there were lots of people whose apps just stopped working. They, you know, they were relying upon this data to get voice of the customer, and, you know, two weeks ago, all of a sudden, they can't pull the data. And this is pretty common. Um, control is also important because, uh, you know, in addition to data access changing due to governance and due to policies, the data itself might just disappear. Like, for example, if companies go out of business. Finally, usage policies might play a role. Um, there's lots of websites, for example, where you're legally prohibited from automatically scraping those websites for data. Doesn't stop people from doing it, but it's, it's still pretty illegal. Um, but in understanding big data, my favorite definition came from one of the, the premier experts in the field um, several years ago. Um, we, were at a, we were at a meeting focused on supercomputing, high-performance computing, and the question came up, what really is big data? You know, this is a, you're in a room full of the world's experts, so you know, we, we should be able to define it. And one of the guys said something that stuck with me. He said, big data is anything bigger or more complex than what your organization is currently prepared to handle. And, you know, it, it really captures the practical sentiment and the experience of dealing with big data well. So where does this data come from? Um, this diagram here shows one way to look at the components of smart manufacturing. Um, and, you know, even if you're not specifically working in manufacturing, Pretty much all of us, uh, we transform inputs to outputs and we add value in the process. So you can use this model to identify some of the data that you should be collecting. On the, on the far left, under data-driven intelligence, um, you should be keeping track of your intelligent agents and algorithms, in particular, how your model parameters are changing as your algorithms learn about the scenarios you're studying. In the middle circle, there's a little bit more foundational, you, you know already that you have to keep track of your suppliers, of your, your workforce, your design documentation, uh, you know, especially if you have to wrap it up in PPAPs, um, and your, your process step, among other things. Um, on the right-hand side there, you can see 
that it's also important to capture information about quality controls and quality events. That's what most GMS software does right now. And your materials, um, maybe even your energy usage. When you're considering data sources that you need to keep track of, this, this diagram is a good place to start to get ideas. But, but there are also tons more. So, you know, your brainstorming isn't, isn't done um, that easily. Um, what about customer interactions? What about social media comments? Um, those can be a great source for capturing voice of the customer. There's some extremely useful data sources that many organizations don't even think about. Um, for example, most orgs um, implement document control, but don't stop to think about managing the actual data within those documents. Um, capturing the intentions of data creators can also help with decision making later because you don't want to accidentally use data for a completely inappropriate purpose. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times we don't capture the original intent when we're storing data. So that's very useful. Um, finally, keeping records of the, the calculations you use to make the business decisions can be helpful. Uh, a lot of these things people don't even realize can be manageable data. Uh, and, you know, even if you're great at identifying the data you need, maybe you're already even capturing it, chances are your data are still in silos, um, at least some of it. And, you know, we're all so busy that it's easy to work ourselves into siloed corners like this, or, or maybe I should say cylinders, a little more cylindrical. So if you want to do something about your silos, it's going to take time, it's going to take effort, it's probably going to take an investment. Um, the easiest way to get out of the silo business is to create a data lake. Um, data lakes contain raw, unformatted data, um, at least all of it is in one place. It's not in multiple disparate systems or on somebody's local hard drive. The situation where you have data on local drives can be, can be even worse if, if people leave the company and their data goes with them. You want to make sure that you can avoid that if at all possible. And, you know, data lakes aren't a perfect solution, but it is a good first step to get all of those data sources, all that raw material into one place. In fact, the, the old concept of unified storage that you may have, you may have addressed in the, the 90s, um, that's just a much less exciting name for a data lake. So you know, these concepts have been around for a while. Uh, a data warehouse, in contrast, usually has a, a rigid structure or a schema. Um, the data lake, though, just has a catalog. Um, the, the whole point is, how do you find stuff that's in it? The original model for this concept of data lake is that, uh, you know, you have a, a, a reservoir, Everybody dumps in their water. It might not be clean water, but at least the water is all in the same lake, making it accessible. Um, whereas the model for a data warehouse is an actual warehouse with inventory. You know exactly what's there, where to find it, how much there is, that sort of thing. And you've thought in a data warehouse, you've thought about how to organize all that data so you don't make a mess. Um, data lakes, they can get to be dirty and unmanageable. In fact, I've heard some people refer to their unmanaged data lakes as data swamps. So, you know, management is still an issue. The, the ultimate solution, whether you've got, um, you know, whether you've taken those steps to, and you have a data warehouse, or you have a data lake, or maybe you have both, um, is to institute some master data management, and, and actually systematic data management in general. And the wheel at the right-hand side that comes from uh, the AMA, which is the Professional Society for Data Management, that's from their data management body of knowledge. And as you'll see in the middle there, data governance, that is the foundation, and we'll, we'll look at that shortly. So with all this data you have to manage, there's one counterintuitive point that I want to bring up. First of all, and, and you know this already, storage is cheap. If you fit the equation of a line to how much a gigabyte of storage costs over time, if you look at that data since 1980, which is the chart on the screen right now, um, data storage is, is comparatively free right now. Um, I pay $2 a month to Google for 100 gigabytes of storage, which to me feels basically free. Um, so with all this cheap storage, you know, you should archive as much data as possible, right? Well, you know, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, the answer is no, you should not archive as much data as possible. And to show you a little anecdote, an anecdotal reason why this is a bad idea, I offer you my own Gmail account. Um, one of the first things that you might notice here is that I actually have a very embarrassing number of unread emails. Um, this number is actually kind of good to me. I was over, uh, over 11,000 a few weeks ago, and I've been trying really, really hard to clean it up. 
I know I could just archive all of these unread messages. I could get rid of that number and not have to worry about it. Just press one button. Um, but to me, that's as good as sending all of my information into a black hole. I mean, I'm, I'm probably never going to use it again, and it'll just be clogging up the world and, and costing me money, even though it's not costing me much money. You know, it's not the, the best situation. Um, additionally, we tend to overestimate the amount of time and money and interest we'll have in mining old, dirty data for insights, right? Um, I mean, besides, are you, like, think about it right now. Are you really interested in getting big data insights from data you archived in 2010? Um, you know, maybe, but chances are no. So the advice is don't archive everything. In fact, save as little as possible. Save only what you need. It's more practical, and, uh, you know, there's, there's not as much for you to feel bad about when you ignore it afterwards. Final point to mention to answer our question of what counts as data is data in motion. Some people call it fast data, but the idea is the same. You've got high volumes of streaming data flowing at you. It's being collected in real time, and you have to make some quick decisions about what aspects of it you need to pay attention to. Then you have to figure out if and when to store it. So um, this is a challenge that small and medium-sized organizations are just starting to explore. It's been the domain of enterprises and, and research institutions uh, until now. Um, in fact, at NRAO, we used to build pipelines for telescope data. We wanted to, as the, as the astronomers were, were doing observations, they needed to make sure that their observation was proceeding normally. And in order to do that, you had to analyze some of the streaming data. Because uh, cost of operations for those telescopes at like $50,000, $60,000 an hour, um, it was kind of important to be able to, to pivot the observation in real time. Um, you know, for example, if you're looking at the wrong galaxy, um, you don't want to spend $60,000 an hour looking at the wrong place. So data has to be, first, first of all, it, it's got to be available. It's got to exist. Um, second, it's got to be accessible. Even if it does exist, if you can't get to it or if you don't have the right permissions for it, that's going to be a problem. And then finally, your data has to be accurate. Um, if not, there's, there's no sense in saving it for perpetuity because, uh, you know, you're just going to, it's just going to cause you to make bad decisions or incorrect inferences. And this brings us to master data management. So master data in your organization is some of the most important data. These are the key objects that your business is built on. And by consciously managing this master data, uh, you can ensure that you establish a single source of truth for the most important information you have. So this practice isn't new. IT departments have been doing some form of this for decades. I mean, you know, some IT departments don't do it at all, but a lot of them do. What's new is that there's going to have to be close collaboration between the IT people and the operations people and the quality people to be able to adapt to the data-driven changes that emerging technologies and in Industry 4.0 are forcing us to face. It's not just an IT issue. Um, successful outcomes are going to depend on building a culture of quality around data um, by creating and following management processes uh, to keep that data accessible, available, and accurate, um, and by you know, rigorously maintaining your processes. So within master data management, um, th these two authors here, um, they have outlined three categories of data. It's a great place to start if you're just trying to figure out what your master data is. Party, thing, and location. So what, what they advocate is, um, first of all, identify key people or key groups of people, number one. Second thing is figure out which objects they use. Um, and, you know, these, this also applies to your, your products and services that you offer to customers and the assets that you have to manage to, to, for service delivery. Um, finally, locations, your facilities or sites, your offices, your sales territories. Um, the thinking is, is that if you have master records of all these objects and if you build processes around them to keep these data objects clean and, and perpetually up to date, then you will have achieved the first goal. Uh, next topic is system of record. So a system of record is an important aspect of master data management because each of those parties and things and locations that you just identified, you have to know for sure which IT system holds them. Um, it seems like a simple problem, but in, in reality it's, it's not um, in day-to-day -day operations. It's not. 
you have to know which system is going to be declared the authoritative system for that piece of data, which system is going to hold the single source of truth. Um, because, you know, it's not just people who are going to look to that system of record for the source of truth, but also other systems. So this chart right here is, is interesting because it shows how um, different systems of record cooperate to cover different parts of the organization and product and process lifecycle. And uh, I've fit uh, QMS and environment health and safety on there as well. So although the, although the boundaries uh, in that previous slide aren't ever going to be distinct and, and certainly won't within your organization, you need to decide where those boundaries will, will fall because you want each one of your systems of record to be authoritative. So it can be the, the origination point for accurate and timely data, and so it can feed other systems that authoritative data uh, that, that it has in it. So in most cases, data in the systems of record is also going to be cleaned. Uh, it's going to be routinely audited. Uh, and in some cases, records are going to be traceable, um, although not, not all organizations do that. Traceability, of course, means that you can see what happened during every step of processing to get a resultant um, a variable or data object. In most cases, too, um, that system of record is going to become a single source of truth. It's kind of like in your organization, you probably have experts that you know you can go to. You can get good information about topics. Maybe Scott is your expert on safety, and maybe Amy is your expert on environmental moder monitoring. If, if you have a question on any of those topics and you go to these people, you can be pretty sure you're going to get good, solid information. So systems of record are like these experts, but instead of offering knowledge and insights, those systems of record offer data and information that your organization can use to turn into knowledge and insights. So how do you know if a system should be a system of record? Or maybe instead of a system of record, it should just be a plain old database because systems of record take more time and effort. Um, they also have to be maintained. So how do you know? One practitioner recommends that you only make a system of record when a repository is going to store proprietary and mission critical data. Um, that's stuff you absolutely need for your business to survive or you know, to, to meet your regulatory and compliance requirements. It's got to be information people use or need to access on a regular basis. And it's got to capture key organizational knowledge that you don't want to lose if people leave the company. Um, ideally, information you want to continuously improve. If you have a more accurate snapshot of your co company's essential information and processes, that might be in one of your systems of record also. And there's, there's evidence all over the research that just taking the step of identifying master data and setting up your, your systems of record, um, just taking those two steps is going to improve the efficiency of your work processes, and it's going to drive continuous improvement in a, in a totally remarkable way. Uh, and the reason why is that when you, when you have those two things set up, when you have master data established and, and you have your systems of record, people can trust the data more. They can trust the reports. They, they can know where to look for information. They won't have to look in multiple places and then wonder which information is the, the right information, especially if they're, they're conflicts. And furthermore, um, with this in place, people will know that if there's a problem, someone will be around to help resolve it because it's a, a key factor of data governance. So the, the solution to coordinating these multiple environments, these multiple systems of record, is data governance. So um, this standard framework for data management, the circle, uh, it represents the data management body of knowledge, and you'll notice that data governance ties it all together. It's in the core. Uh, governance means establishing the plans, the policies, programs, practices around how your data is going to be checked and modeled and managed. And, you know, data management is just quality management for data. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very similar to if, if you've done um, quality systems for a while, it's, it's very similar. It's just that you're Objective emphasis is the data. Notice too that data security is one of the elements of data management here. Um, we'll, we'll, we all know that you have to protect sensitive information or, or personal data from hacking or from phishing attacks. Most organizations train their employees to avoid phishing attacks, but there are even bigger emerging reasons to take this seriously. 
uh, to implement data management so that we can take this seriously. Let me show you one of them. So these are these are muffins. Uh, while most of them are muffins, you might notice that some of them are, are chihuahuas. And for your human brain, it's probably easy to pick out, in most cases, which pictures are food and which pictures are dogs. But now imagine that you have machine vision systems in your company, and the job of the machine vision is to pick out, maybe from items rolling down a conveyor, um, which items are actual muffins and which ones are not. We don't want to put any dogs in our muffin containers, obviously. Um, and, you know, image processing these days, particularly when it uses deep learning, is, is pretty accurate. But there's a case where it's not. So let's assume that we have the data. It's accurate. It's available. We have the single source of truth that we need in the form of that image on the left. And we've built a machine learning classifier to tell us whether this image is showing a blueberry muffin or not. So imagine that you have a, a, an attacker. Someone launches a cyber attack against your system. Um, they want to interfere with the operations of your, of your manufacturing plant. And what they do is they're going to add noise to your image. So um, this can be done when your image is at rest, sitting on a, in a data repository, or maybe when it's in motion, when it's just streaming um, the, in real time. So the noise is that image of TV static you see in the middle. When you add the original image to the TV static, it won't change what the image looks like. So in this sequence, the original image at the left is added to noise in the middle, and then you get an image on the right that looks identical to the original picture, but, but there's a problem now, because just adding this noise breaks your classifier, and your classifier won't be able to pick out muffins accurately, you know, potentially resulting in dogs in your muffin box. Um, so this, this particular stra attack strategy, even though I'm showing you uh, this on a classification problem, it can apply to any other functions on the, the list there, any other functions of, of machine learning. Uh, and you know, the, the muffins versus chihuahua problem, it's, it's an absurd example, but it does illustrate uh, what considerations will be on the line in the future and emphasize why protecting your data is so significant, whether it's data at rest or data in motion. So when you're developing data governance strategies for data security, um, visibility and transparency are often important, but they have to be weighed against confidentiality. And as a result, you have to think carefully about the data and information you make visible through dashboards or, or even how and if you want a human in the loop. And a lot of organizations have analytics people. You can ask them to go pull reports. Um, this is useful when you don't know where to find information, but it's also slow. So the reason that dashboards exist is to help you see connections between different kinds of data. But in practice, those dashboards don't always end up helping you that way. So a goal of data management is to determine the appropriate levels of visibility and transparency, put together an architecture to make it happen, and then open up your data and information in an appropriate way, which brings us to dashboards. So from the perspective of the, the quality manager or, or the operations manager, being able to see your data is essential. But what you really want is to be able to use that data to make better decisions, decisions like where should I focus my resources or um, what risks are the most risky? What, what risks need my immediate attention? Is there a situation or an incident about to happen? And should I intervene? Is there anything I can do? Things like that. So in most organizations, all of this processing has to happen in your head. Um, but there's two ways that we can make it easier. The more complex path is to implement machine learning algorithms that continuously scan your operations data and can make recommendations to answer these questions. The easier and more immediate path is just to spend a little more time making your dashboards meaningful. And here's what I mean by that. Most of the dashboards that I see lack context. It's kind of like somebody said, hey, you know, we're, we're gathering a lot of information in our, in our system. Let's just show it all to people. Let's show people all that information. And not much attention is given to, you know, is this level good? Is it bad? How do we know if it's good or bad? Um, should we do anything? Those kind of questions. And all of them, all of those questions are addressable by bringing the operator or the subject matter expert deeply into the dashboard creation process and, and making it a process where you learn and grow over time based on your own data. The moral of the story is 
Dashboards don't have to be like your car dashboard, even though the name is the same. Make your dashboards more like your navigation system. I mean, you might even have a navigation system on your dashboard in your car, so it, it hopefully won't be too much of a stretch to start imagining um, how navigation displays might guide your daily decision making instead of just um, providing you with information. So here's an example. Here's an example of um, making dashboards meaningful. About 10 years ago, I, I worked at a brewery, and the problem that we had was that in January and February, they were getting a lot of complaints about the taste of the beer. So, um, you know, although this is from a different data set, that red circle um, shows lots of defects, lots of defective beer due to taste. So a root cause analysis, we launched one. And, you know, because we were thinking, uh, because we were trying to be systems thinkers, um, we took a look at the supply chain for all of the ingredients, including the water. Um, that went into the product. So water is a huge component of beer, and for this particular brewery, all of the water came from a local reservoir. So we decided to do water quality sampling. We did it over the course of an entire year because we wanted to see if water issues might be influencing the taste of the beer, might be causing these spikes in the defect. So um, what, we, what we discovered was actually really interesting. It, it turns out in the fall, there's lots of rain in this area where the brewery is located. And so that rain falls on leaves that have fallen off the trees. The leaves are on the ground. They get rained on. And that, that water runs off into the reservoir. The extra acidity um, makes it into the, the reservoir itself, and, and that impacts lots of aspects of, of the water quality. But the process is slow, and it's gradual. And turns out it takes weeks between the rain falling on the leaves and the beer uh, the, the beer that was produced, you know, having that, that taste that people didn't like. So we found that small changes in the water quality would impact the beer quality like six to eight weeks later. So our solution, there were two parts to our solution. One was expensive and one wasn't. Um, the first thing was to install a cistern to store good fresh water before those fall rains started. Um, and then the second one was to add water quality monitoring to the dashboard. We wanted it to be a leading indicator, and we wanted to, to add a prediction of when the changes in water quality might be impacting product quality. So more meaningful data led to more effective decisions. So that's just one example of what I'm, I'm talking about. But as you can see, um, it took a learning process, you know, getting those dashboards to be meaningful. Um, you know, you can't just implement them by setting down requirements. You have to use the data you have to see what kinds of decisions that you need to make with them and then you have to adjust appropriately. So finally, our last point, effective information and knowledge management. Uh, this can greatly improve cross-functional communication and overall performance. Um, for this particular task, I like to use the Baldridge Excellence Framework. It's maintained by the um, National Institute for Standards and Technology, by NIST. Uh, they're based in Maryland. Uh, and, and this can serve as the glue between strategy and data operations. So while the, the data management body of knowledge, that, that circle you saw earlier with governance in the middle, while that describes what needs to be done from an IT perspective, there still might be a gap between IT and purpose. And the Baldrige framework helps solve that problem. So it provides questions to help you do a self-study of your operations, and it, it, it it consists of uh, seven different sections. So the first six are process sections. The last section is a results section. And um, out of those first six process sections, Criterion 4, Chapter 4, um, addresses data and how you use it. So in Section 4.1, uh, the Baldridge Excellence Framework, it asks you to identify how you track and evaluate operations data, how you continuously review that data, uh, and you might do it in real time or in regular meetings or reviews or maybe both, and how you improve your organization's performance based on that data. In section 4.2, also of the, the Baldridge Excellence Framework, the, the strategy is tied to IT operations. So this is the link to the circular diagram that outlines those areas of, of data management. Uh, Baldridge Framework, it asks you to reflect on how you capture and grow and evolve your institutional knowledge and, and your best practices. And just a, just a side note about best practices. Just because you're using a framework like ISO 9001 
does not mean you're using best practices. Best practices, they, they specify highly effective ways to get things done, but they're usually turned to tune to your organization or your industry. So, um, you know, best practices are, are how you get the work done, not what you do. So just a, a side note there. Another one of the things that I really like about the Baldrige framework is that with respect to data, um, it asks us to look at several aspects of the data, uh, not just the values that we use to monitor operations, those are called levels, um, but it also asks us to look at the data that helps us evaluate whether those levels are, are good or bad and what you can do about them in practice. So th this approach called let's see, L-E-T-C-I, let's see, sounds like let's see, uh, can help you critically evaluate every type of data that you use for decision making. It can be really helpful. So all of these aspects of data management that we've discussed, all of them are essential for helping you use your data to create value and then expand and extend that value to generate business impact, not just now, but in perpetuity. And with respect to technology-enabled quality management, Industry 4.0 and Quality 4.0, data management practices, solid data management practices, contribute to achieving each one of these objectives. You may ask, well, you know, it's probably expensive. Is it worth the time and effort? And the answer is an overwhelming yes. Although there's tons of examples from the research, I just wanted to share one article that discusses some results from companies that pursued this single source of truth, um, identifying their master data, architecting a solution to protect integrity of data, currency of data, and helping people navigate that single source of truth. So. $75 million in benefits to one large company in just one year. That's, that's pretty big. And then in another example, 190% ROI with only a two-year payback period. So these are just two small examples, um, and there's, there's plenty more uh, in the, the research. The, the bottom line from this study, which was co-authored by Tom Davenport, he's, um, he's recognized as one of the earliest researchers who studied analytics and the strategic value of analytics. Um, bottom line is that even the process of going through a data management self-study usually pays for itself. So that's, that's a good thing. So where does that leave us? In short, it leaves us with six steps. Uh, these can help us make progress towards getting this single source of truth, from getting value from that single source of truth, and then optimizing uh, the potential for beneficial impacts. And even though software is an important part of this process, it's not just the technology that will help you be successful. It's also the policies and the procedures and the governance, all of those structures underlying how you create and use and share your data and information, not just within your organization, but also with your suppliers, with your collaborators, and with your customers. So let's see. So this brings us to the end of today's webinar. Um, the, uh, I'm, like I mentioned earlier, I'm from Intellex, and um, uh, the reason this is important to Intellex, this whole concept of system of record, is that we've recently partnered with Honeywell uh, to become an EHSQ system of record um, to link together moment by moment, day by day operations in safety critical environments to the fast data, the data in motion that's generated by um, IoT. Devices. So, so the goal is, is be able to use contextual indicators to understand relationships between the environment, health, safety, and quality, and to be able to anticipate problems before they arise, uh, aiming for the goal of zero worker deaths by 2050. So this, this brings us to the end. Um, I can answer your questions here or offline, and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Um, thanks for attending. Appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Cole. And uh, uh, yeah, we've got we've got a, a couple questions here. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, for those of you who came in late, if you have a question, you can send your questions to us using the Q and A box down in the lower right hand corner of your screen. You might see it down there, or you might have a drop down menu at the top of your screen. If you mouse to the top of your screen, you might see a drop down menu. There should be a Q and A button. Click that. That'll open up the Q and A box, and you can uh, send us your questions. Um, before we get into the questions. Um, uh, you used an acronym uh, a few slides ago, uh, KM. Uh, was that knowledge management? I'm not sure. I, I don't remember the context you used it in. That is knowledge management, yes. Thank you. It was knowledge management. Oh. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so one of the questions we have is how can we replace our multi 
SOR with a new SOR. And I'm assuming what they mean by that is one SOR <laughs> control all the SORs. <laughs> Um, so you, you don't actually need one. Um, there's a difference between systems of record and, and sources of truth. And in fact, um, one, one um, topic of research right now is, you know, maybe multiple sources of truth are okay. But um, basically the idea is, you know, put yourself in the perspective of a business decision maker or, you know, an operator or anybody else who's, who's doing the day-to-day -day work of your business processes. Um, Put yourself in, in their shoes. Figure out what information they need to do their job and then make sure, number one, they know where to get it. And number two, there's not multiple places to go get it, that you've, you've put that um, authoritative referential data in a findable, trustable location. So, you know, oftentimes what happens is, uh, you know, an organization, a, a siloed organization, um, you might have one functional division, they buy a great piece of enterprise software to perform one task. And then over on the other side of the organization, they buy another very similar piece of software to do a task that's different, but pretty much, you know, it has a lot of shared, shared um, aspects. So, uh, you know, aiming for that single source of truth means that you're going to step back and look at all of the repositories across your organization and consciously work to make sure there's only one source of truth for each piece of master data that you need to, to keep track of. And when, when I say master data, I don't just mean things like, um, you know, your customers or your suppliers. I also mean things like your documents. So, you know, data doesn't just have to be records in a database. Okay. Can you elaborate a little bit about what the difference is between the structure of a data lake versus a data warehouse. Uh, that was, um, yeah, that, that, the data lake part just seems, a, was a little confusing to me as well. Yeah, okay, so um, uh, the, the concept of data lake was kind of like a, a step one towards going from really siloed um, databases and, and indi in, in, independent individual data stores um, to move from that extremely siloed state of the world to putting it all in one place and cataloging it. So, you know, it, it, at the very least, you as an individual in your organization, you can see who's got what data where. And even if you have to take the step of contacting that person who owns the data to get it out of their data repository, just knowing it exists is going to prevent you from maybe starting up a new repository and, and you know, causing problems that way. Um, so I just, I forgot your question. Can you say it again? Oh, uh, so just the difference between a data lake and a data warehouse, and, and I guess, and, and they're asking specifically about the structure. I mean, is, is one just or is a data house organized, and the data lake is unorganized? Yes, basically. So the the data warehouse has a, a unified structure. Um, I know the ones that I worked on 15-ish years ago. We spent a lot of time putting together a, a single database schema making sure that that schema was, was normalized, it was third order normal. Uh, and so data warehouses, very, very structured. Um, you can think of them, like I said, as a, a warehouse with inventory that's traceable, very orderly. Um, data lakes don't have to be quite as orderly, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why, um, why they can get a little bit uh, you know, more disorganized. There's, there's more controls on a data warehouse. But the problem is, is that advancing advancing your data repositories to the place where you have enough structure for a data warehouse, two things of that. Number one, it takes a lot of time and effort and money. The second thing is you might not actually want to do that. Um, for example, let's say that in your company you have a, you have Salesforce and you have a manufacturing execution system. You probably don't want to get a data warehouse that has a single database with all the data in those two systems. It's much more practical to step back and take a look at how can I help people find the data that they need and make sure that they don't put multiple records in multiple places so that we lose our sense of truth. Well, and, and that, that actually leads me to a question I had was don't, in, in order to, how do I say, in order to make life easier for everybody, don't at some point we need some common data standard, some common data format standard so that we can extract things from this lake without having to, I don't know, customize, you know, software every time in order to somehow filter out what it is we need and organize it in the way that we need. 
Yeah, and I mean, the answer is maybe and maybe not. So, you know, as far as the, the specific structure and formatting of the data, I think you should leave that to your IT people because they're the ones who need to maintain it. However, you need to, to separate out the notion of needing to find and use that data from how it's structured. So, you know, from, from the perspective of um, people who are not in IT, quality people, operations people, um, as long as you can get to the information that you need quickly and make the decisions you need to make about it, that's the goal. And unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, that's really difficult right now because of the management issues. Okay. Well, uh, well for, for companies like Intellix, then, is part of what you do um, is, is provide interfaces so that you can pull in data from, let's say, the various uh, the, the various data sources, which might be in all sorts of different formats, in order to make use out of that data, uh, is is that part of what is that part of what a company like Analytics does? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of those one of those things that you have to to deal with there is figuring out how much to build into the systems and whether to supplement it with people who can help as well. You know, everything doesn't have to be automated. Everything doesn't have to be. Uh, a technological solution. And, and as quality professionals, we know that, you know, the right combination of people and process and technology to achieve the goals that we're trying to keep in focus, that's what we're trying to, to aim for. Okay. And uh, w with regards to dashboards, where are we with, um, with artificial intelligence? Help us see the connections between the data we've collected and the outcomes, uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Is in, in other words, to maybe see those, con like in your beer example, um, uh, rather than you have to go out and, and try to draw the connection between, <laughs> between rain and increased acidity in the water, where are we with AI being able to kind of make, help us make that connection? Um, I think we're still about seven to 10 years out from that. Um, for the foreseeable future, uh, you're going to have to have domain experts involved in, in sifting through the data and making the connections. Um, because, you know, they, 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 there's so many examples of companies who don't do that, who, you know, want, want fast answers, and so they, they end up getting in, in really interesting um, binds. Um, my favorite example from the past couple of months is that uh, one of the big – consulting firms, I can't remember which one, which is probably a good thing. Um, one of the big consulting firms okay. decided that they were going to implement um, a, a machine learning based systems to sort through all the resumes that they get. So what they did was they built a training set uh, for resumes of people who had been successfully hired into their company. They didn't take a look at performance reviews. So they didn't take a, a look at people who performed well versus people who didn't. They just took a look at people who had been hired successfully. And so okay. what they did with this training data is they built a system to help them sift through the tens of thousands of resumes and find, you know, a, a shorter stack that they could, that they could focus their efforts on. Um, so what ended up happening uh, when they, when they took a look at how this classifier was operating, they, they implemented it, right? And then they used it for a while. And then somebody said, Hey, maybe we should like step back and see what's going on inside this black box. And somebody did. And they found out that the number one, um, well, actually, there, there's two of them. The, 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 the two top factors for predicting whether someone would get hired were that their name was Jared and they played lacrosse. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's funny, but it's also it's terrible. I mean, it really underscores the need to, you know, um, if you are implementing AI in your dashboard to, to try and help you sift through the information, it's got to be a, a relatively slow, deliberate process because you can end up making decisions that are heavily biased, and that's not going to help anybody. Uh, you know, somebody asked a question, and then they said skip it. They found out what it was. But I think you've mentioned this before, so it's probably worth uh, explaining it again. You had uh, statistics with R. Can you explain yeah. what that is? Um, so in April, the third edition of my statistics book came out, and so if you want to learn how to do inferential stats and, and um, analyze your own data to, to examine hypotheses, um, my book will show you how to do that in the business context. So um, if, you're, if you're on this webinar, feel free to email me. I'll send you the PDF, but it's also on Amazon, about um, 500 pages worth of excellent how to analyze your own data in a free open source programming language. 
and you're welcome for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, okay, well, we are out of time. That is the uh, that is the end of it for today. And actually, uh, there were no more questions anyway. So perfect. Uh, so thanks, Nicole, for the presentation. I appreciate your time Thank today. You, and thanks to all of you, of course, for joining us. Uh, as I said at the top of the program, you will be receiving an email to a link. Um, <laughs> as my phone starts to ring. Uh, you'll be receiving an email with a link to a recording of this webinar as well as a PDF of the slides within about a day. So uh, keep your eye on out for that email. Uh, so for all, all of us here at Quale Digest and Intellex, have a great day, and we will see you at the next webinar. So long. <laughs>